um, welcome to the departmental seminar. I think we'll make a start. Um, I'm Professor Margaret Mack, is the Associate Dean of Faculty of Health and Social Sciences and Physiotherapy Teaching Faculty of Department of Rehabilitation Sciences. I have great pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, Dr. Thompson Wong, who is the Assistant Professor of Physiotherapy of the Department of Rehabilitation Sciences. Uh, Dr. Wong, hello. Yes, hello. <laughs> okay, and um, Dr. Wong graduated from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University with a BSc in Physiotherapy. He earned his Master of Science in Sports uh, Science and PhD in Sports Science and Human Performance from the University of Hong Kong. He is an experienced physiotherapist with a wide range of clinical experience in different rehabilitation settings. The research interests of Dr. Wong are geriatrics, force, and psychosocial rehabilitation. Dr. Wong has secured many major competitive research grants, such as Early Career Scheme, General Research Fund, and Health and Medical Research Fund. For services, Dr. Wong is an executive committee member of Geriatric Specialty Group of the Hong Kong Physiotherapy Association, and he has been appointed as a board member of the International Editorial Review Board of the Journal of Physiotherapy since 2014. So Dr. Wong is going to present uh, the topic, conscious motor processing and movement disruption in implications for forced rehabilitation. So with, uh, um, uh, without further ado, let, uh, let us welcome Dr. Thompson, Thompson Wong. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I have to share my screen first. Um, okay. Can you all see my screen? Uh, yes, I can see. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. All right. Can you all hear me clearly? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the introduction from Professor Mac. Thank you very much. And my name is uh, Thompson, uh, and I'm an assistant professor from the Department of Rehabilitation Science. Um, welcome all of you to the research seminar, the lunch seminar today, and also welcome uh, the uh, participants from overseas or even from the other side of the group. Thank you very much for your support and participation uh, before the long holiday. All right, so today I would like to share with you a research area or a theory that has not been investigated for a very long time in rehabilitation. But indeed, this theory has been developed since 1992 in experimental psychology as well as sports psychology. The theory is called reinvestment. Okay, it is, it is not related to finance, of course. All right, so uh, the topic that I would like to share with you today is conscious motor processing or reinvestment and movement disruption, implications for force rehabilitation. Okay, so before I start, perhaps I would like to briefly introduce my clinical as well as uh, academic background. So after I graduated from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, I was working as a frontline clinical physiotherapist at the Princess Margaret Hospital for around 14 years. So as you can see from this picture, I'm looking quite young at that time. At the right hand side of, of this picture, as you can see, uh, uh, this was the picture that I took around the year of 2003. So I also participate in a treating disease patient in the Princess Margaret Hospital. So after I accumulate around uh, 14 years of clinical experience, I decided to move to the academic center at the University of Hong Kong, I work as a faculty member at the University of Hong Kong, <clears throat> initially at the Institute of Human Performance and then at the School of Public Health at the Faculty of Medicine. As a result, I accumulate sports-related 
research uh, and teaching experience, as well as health-related teaching and research experience. And after a few years of uh, uh, accumulating experience in the University of Hong Kong, I moved to the Department of Rehabilitation Science. That was the department that I graduated from. I'm very glad that uh, I can have this opportunity to serve my profession again. So that is me. All right, for my research interests, my primary research interest is geriatric and forced rehabilitation. I'm also interested in psychomotor rehabilitation. That is the combination of psychological concepts or theory into physical training for rehabilitation, especially for older adults in needs. I'm also interested in motor control and learning, particularly in sports, as well as in older adults. I'm interested in postural control assessment and training. And finally, I'm also very interested in tele-rehabilitation. Uh, I would like to develop different mobile apps to prescribe exercise for patients in need, especially for older adults. And I have collaborated with uh, different non-governmental organizations or uh, scholars overseas or locally uh, to develop different apps for different populations. All right. So what I would like to share with you today, as I mentioned before, it is a relatively, relatively new concept to be developed in rehabilitation. But indeed, this theory has been developed in experimental psychology and sport psychology for many years, since 1992. The theory is called reinvestment, all right? Uh, so what is reinvestment? I would like to share with you first. And then uh, during the presentation, I will use the term conscious motor processing or reinvestment. I will mostly use the term reinvestment because both terms indeed, they are interchangeable. So uh, in the following presentation, I will mostly use the term reinvestment. Secondly, how can we assess trade and real time reinvestment, which is very important, right? Thirdly, I will present to you about different investigations in reinvestment so that I can show you the roles of reinvestment in different population groups. And finally, I will present to you about different studies or research projects that we completed or completed by our research collaborator so that I can show you the implications of reinvestment, especially in older adults. So forced rehabilitation in older adults. All right, let's look at this video. He is Chow, a quite famous PGA golf player. Of course, his golf paying skill should be automatic and professional, right? So for this very short distance of golf putting motor task, he should be able to do it very easily. However, in some circumstances, for example, movement difficulties, fear, or lots of people in front of him, eagerness to win the match, and then he may perform like that even with the automatic skill. Uh, I'm very sorry about that. A very poor performance indeed. Um, so what caused this, the optimization of movement? One of the potential answer should be reinvestment, all right? So what is reinvestment? According to the FIS and POSLA, three stage model of motor learning, I think that most of you should have learned it before. When we are required to learn a new skill, we have to go through the cognitive stage 
and then to the associative stage, and then finally to the autonomous stage with decreasing level of attention and decreasing the level of utilization of movement related verbal rules, or sometimes we can call it as decorative rules, and then to the autonomous stage. However, due to some circumstances, for example, fear, movement difficulties, or even disease, an individual would tend to regress their autonomic skill to rest their cognitive stage using the movement related rules again. All right, they have to use the rules to control their movement again. So the action of reinvesting the verbal rules in the automatic movement is called reinvestment. All right, so let me provide you with an example. If you have driving license, for example, at the first driving lesson, your driving teacher should have taught you about of skills, the verbal rules in manipulation of the gearbox, the crutch, or you have to look at the mirrors seriously. And during the learning process, you have to use a lot of rules to control your movement. All right, so you cannot be able to direct your attention to the other direction, all right? But after some time of training, you may reach the associative stage and then you pass your driving test. And finally, when you drive at the normal circumstances, after long time of driving uh, practice, you will reach the autonomous stage indeed. So at that time, you don't have to remember what your driving teacher told you about the rules, right? You don't have to remember the rules at that time. You can uh, carry out your movement quite automatically. However, due to some circumstances, for example, very poor environment, a very heavy rainy day, or you have to catch up your girlfriend very quickly, you're under pressure, then you have to remember the verbal rules again to control your driving, all right? So that is simply what we call reinvestment, all right? So before I move to the formal definition of reinvestment, perhaps I would like you to vote, okay? So you can type yes or no at the chat box to let me know whether you think that reinvestment, the conscious motor processing, is likely to be problematic, all right? So let's type at your chat box and let me know, do you understand what is reinvestment? Okay, so you can start now. You can type in your chat box. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, I can see a lot of response. Yes and no, okay. Yes, some say yes. Okay. Yes and no. Okay, yes. All right. Okay. So thank you very much for your participation. It seems that most of you are correct. All right. Most of you think that we investment is likely to be problematic. Okay. So thank you very much for your answer. So for the formal definition of conscious motor processing, that is reinvestment. According to masters in 1992, as well as masters and colleagues in 1993, it was defined as a quality factor or personality trait. It described a purposeful attempt to online control the movement using our previously acquired verbal rules related to the movements, or we can also call it as explicit decorative knowledge. However, this action will disrupt our performance, especially under stress. And the process of switching from an automatic form of control to a conscious form of control is called 
we must run. So why we must run? It seems to be problematic. We can refer to a theory of working memory then. Actually, the theory of reinvestment has been linked quite closely with the theory of working memory. So according to the working memory theory by a very famous scientist, Bradley, in 1994, he defined that working memory as a short-term store with limited capacity. So you can imagine the working memory like the RAMs of your computer, all right? Of course, with limited capacity, unless you have a lot of money to buy a lot of RAMs. Otherwise, it is limited, right? And for many of the skills, we have to use the short-term store, the working memory, like when I'm trying to transfer my bottle of tea to the other hand and then back to my first hand. Of course, I'm not going to advertise the Wulong tea in this seminar. But in this action, we have to use the short-term memory. And for example, when we are trying to walk, when we have to look at the traffic lights at the same time, then we have to use the short-term memory to execute our movement. So why reinvestment is problematic is because if an individual is trying to reinvest with the verbal rules towards the limited working memory, the reinvestment may occupy part of or most of the working memory. And as a result, it will be quite difficult for an individual to do two tasks at the same time because of the limited working memory, or even worse, an individual cannot be able to perform primary tasks, even walking. Okay, so that's why reinvestment is problematic for an individual, especially for older adults. So the potential consequences are skill failure, of course, as you can see the picture right there, or reduction in dual tasking capability. For example, when an older adult is walking, he or she cannot be able to look at the traffic light at the same time. So reduction in dual tasking capability. All right, the reinvestment theory can also be linked with a quite famous observation that is the stop walking when talking observation by Loden Olsen and the team at the year of 1997 published at the Lancet. All right, the stop walking when talking test actually is a very simple test. The assessors only need to walk with the older person. All right, and at the same time, the assessor start conversation with the older person. Okay, for some of the older people, of course, they will walk continuously, okay, and then talk to you. But for some of the other older people, they may need to stop walking when they start conversation with the assessor. So for those stopper, Luton Olsen and the team found that the positive four predictive weight, predictive value was around 83%. It means that Eight, more than eight out of 10 older people will have an four incident within the six months follow up. So it is quite alarming, right? The four predictive value. So they conclude that stop walking when talking may predict force in the elderly. The authors argue that it may be because for those stopper, they don't have sufficient dual tasking capability that they have to use for their daily living, right? But it can also be because of reinvestment. For example, for those older adults with high reinvestment propensity, if they ho have already reinvest, they have already occupied parts of or most of their working memory. And at the same time, it can further worsen their dual tasking capability. And my research collaborators and the team have also investigated the links between reinvestment and stop walking when talking. So we published a paper at Experimental Brain Research in the year of 2016. We found that the participants who stopped walking when talking 
reported highest goals of conscious motor processing, that is reinvestment. So we work out our first working model, that is increased fear of falling, could increase anxiety and self-consciousness. And as a result, it could increase reinvestment and at the same time, decrease the capacity of our working memory for executing motor tasks. And therefore, uh, an individual cannot be able to perform dual tasking effectively. Ultimately, it could increase risk of falling. All right, so up to now, uh, we know what is reinvestment, right? And uh, reinvestment appears to be not good because of the role in working memory. But how can we assess trade and real-time conscious motor processing, that is reinvestment clinically? Indeed, Professor Masters and his teams has already developed the reinvestment scale in the year of 1993 with 20 item scale. Uh, they divided the skills uh, from three different psychological concepts, including the sleep of action, uh, self-awareness, and rehearsal. So three psychological concepts. And at the year of 2002, they further modify the reinvestment scale into more movement specific. All right. So uh, they changed the name of the reinvestment scale into movement specific reinvestment scale in the year of 2002. And in the year of 2005, they further translated the MSRS into the Chinese version. So basically, the MSRS is a scale with 10 items and six prone like system, the responder is required to express the extent of agreement to each statement from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So higher scores represent higher trade reinvestment propensity. So there are two sub-factors within the, the MSLS, including the first factor, the conscious motor processing, CMP. It refers to the tendency to focus attention on one's specific bodily movement. So how you concern about your bodily movements. So there are five items uh, explaining the CMP factor one. And an example item could be, I reflect about my movement a lot. For the factor two, movement self-consciousness, it refers to the tendency of an individual to conscious about their public image when they're moving. So there are five items explaining the factor two, the MSC. An example item could be, I am concerned about what people think about me when I am moving. So in the year of 2001, because we only have a scale to measure the trade reinvestment propensity, right? So in the year of 2001, 2011, Xu and uh, his colleagues developed a measurement of real-time reinvestment to reflect the real-time propensity of reinvestment. They used the EEG TV upset coherence. For the TV region, at our lab temporal rope, it is responsible for verbal analytical processing, all right, at the lab temporal rope. And for the F set, at our frontal loop, it is responsible for motor planning. So the coherence or the coactivation between the TV and F set represent when an individual is planning their movement, they're trying to do the verbal analytical processing, which fits the theoretical framework of reinvestment. That is, when you're trying to execute your movement, you are trying to use the verbal rules to control your movement. So the measurement of uh, TV upset coherence is not very difficult because we want the measurement to be quite specific and relatively simple to use. So we just used six electrodes, of course, including the FSET and T3. We measure the T3 FSET coherence. We also need a T4 at the right temporal lobe, which is responsible for whistle spatial processing. So we also measure the FSET T4 
coherence. The measurement of FSET T4 coherence is used to decrease the possibility that the increase in FSET T3 is due to the global activation of our brain. So we have to measure the FSET T4 as well. And we also have one electro at the left psychomatic bone to, de to detect our eye flag. Okay, and we need one ground electro at the left mastoid and the other reference electro at the right mastoid. So at 2011, Xu and uh, his colleagues invited an engineer from US in neuroscience to write the script to an analyze the T3 FSET for them. Okay, so as you can see from the pictures right there, T3 and electro at the left temporal lobe responsible for verbal analytical processing, motor planning, FSET, FSET at the frontal midnight. We also need a T4 electro at the right temporal lobe for uh, visual spatial uh, processing. Uh, we need an electro at the left psychomatic bone to detect the eye flag. We also need one electro at the left hand side as a ground electro at the mastoid and at the right side as the uh, reference electro. So we based on the 1020 system of electro placement of EEG to position our electrodes. All right, so uh, as we want to validate the uh, method of using uh, T3 FSEC coherence to measure the real-time reinvestment, we published the other article at the gauge, on uh, gauge and posture at the year of 2016. We would like to validate this methodology. The experiment was indeed very simple. We just asked our participants to sway their body intentionally and focusing on their bodily movement. That is internal focus, all right? And we also asked our participants to sway their body together with the metronome, okay? According to the beat of the metronome. That is external focus. So the result was the T3 FSET EEG coherence for the internal focus condition is significantly higher than the external focus instruction. So basically, we can measure the intention of an individual to focus their attention internally to their body. So it seems that EEG T3 coherence is sensitive in detecting changes of attentional focus in poise through control, as well as measuring the real-time reinvestment. We also published the article at the Journal of Motor Behavior to further validate the utilization of T3 FSET coherence as a measurement of real-time reinvestment. At that time, we would like to increase the task difficulty progressively, all right? Theoretically, when we try to increase the task difficulty, the stress will increase as well. So the real-time reinvestment, that is the T3 FSET, should increase as well. So at that experiment, we invite older participants, they stand on the foam and then stand on different standing positions from wide base standing to level base standing and then to tandem standing, obviously with increasing task difficulty. And the result was, we found that when we try to increase the task difficulty, the T3 FSET coherence in EEG increase progressively with the task difficulty. And when we are trying to compare the EEG T3 FSET coherence between the high reinvestor and low reinvestor, we found that the EEG T3 FSET was generally higher for the high reinvestor when we compare to the low reinvestor. So it appears that we have already validated the method of using uh, EEG T3 FSET coherence to measure the real-time reinvestment. Of course, we do have the other follow-up studies uh, in different motor tasks to further validate this method. All right, so up to now, we know that firstly, what is reinvestment, right? And secondly, reinvestment appears to be not good because of the role in working memory. Thirdly, we know a little bit of how could we measure reinvestment, trade reinvestment propensity, and as well as the real-time reinvestment propensity. So now I would like to present to you about the roles of conscious motor processing, that is reinvestment in different population groups. So did we do any study
to investigate the investment in the other population. Of course, as I've already mentioned to you, the investment is a theory that originated from sport psychology and experimental psychology. So there are lots of investiga investigation of the investment in sports and also in motor skill learning. For example, in squash, in golf, in uh, rugby, and etc. The investment has also uh, investigated quite extensively in surgical education as well, uh, especially for those junior medical doctors as well as uh, the medical students when they're trying to learn the surgical skills. The investment has also investigated uh, quite extensively in speech and hearing science, as well as the developmental training. Of course, there are a lot of publications that related to the investment. And as a result, I cannot be able to present to you all of the, the publications. But if you're interested in the theory of the investment and you don't want to read a lot of articles, you are suggested to look at this article, The Theory of the Investment, published at the year of 2008 at the International Review of Sport and Exercise Psychology. Then you should know more about the theory and of the investment and its investigation in different population. Of course, we are now completing a uh, more latest we will uh, to examine uh, the relationship between the investment and motor skills. We hope that uh, the publication can be published very soon so that we can update your information about the theory of the investment. All right, so what about the investment in disease group? Actually, the investment was discovered in a patient with Parkinson's disease as well. The propensity for the investment increased over time in people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, and uh, Professor Rich Masters published an article at the new rehabilitation in new repair at the year of 2007. That is, when you are trying to compare the reinvestment score for Parkinson's patient with more than 16 years of disease to those patients with one to four years of Parkinson's disease, their reinvestment scores are doubled. Reinvestment was also discovered in stroke patients as well. So in a publication uh, published in the year of 2009 at the new rehabilitation in new repair, uh, the team found that stroke patient scores significantly higher than the age match control at the MSRS, including the two factors, the factor one, conscious motor processing, and the second factor, the movement self-consciousness. When they're trying to compare 148 stroke patients with the other 148 age match control. So what about the investment in older adults? So what about the other investigation of the investment in older adults that can implicate our practice? So in the foreign times, I'm going to present to you about our research project or our collaborators research project concerning the investment in older adults so that we can provide you with potential implication of the investment in rehabilitation. Okay, so we started our investigation of the investment in older adults at the year of 2005. So at that year, we found a significant and moderate correlations among movement specific reinvestment scale, force efficacy scale, and the birth balance scale. And high reinvestment in older adults was found to be associated with poor, uh, a higher fear of falling and poor balance. So we constructed our uh, fundamental theoretical model. We thought that there are interrelationships between reinvestment and elderly force, reinvestment and fear of falling, reinvestment and balance and mocking ability. And ultimately, we think that reinvestment could cause elderly force. So in the year of 2008 and 2009, we published two articles in the new rehabilitation and new repair and the Journal of American Geriatric Society. And in summary, we found that uh, when we are trying to compare the reinvestment propensity between elder fallers and non-fallers, elder fallers had a higher propensity to reinvest 
than known forests. And in our experimental study, we found that the elder forests tend to allocate more attention internally to their own bodily movement, especially under stress when they're trying to walk. In our logistic regression, we also found that the factor one, the conscious motor processing subscale, should be able to effectively differentiate elder folders from elder long folders. All right, because of those interesting findings, we attempted to apply for different research grants to support our further investigation in reinvestment and older adults. So the first grant that we got from the uh, RGC uh, was aiming to examine the allocation of attention as well as the gaze behavior, our gaze behavior as a function of reinvestment when our older adults are trying to let Leverage the environment with obstacles. So we simulate the environment with obstacle in our laboratory. All right. So as you can see from this figure that uh, present our experimental setup, we do have different obstacles in our six meter walkway. All right, and even the external obstacles or the external object, the fan, the lamp. We also have a stepping target. So all the participants were required to step on the stepping target accurately before they move to the obstacle and then to the stopping line. We also have a trigger to initiate the walking of our participant in different walking trials. Uh, we, have, uh, we have written an experimental program to uh, provide a tone randomly during walking of our participant which was adapted from uh, the experimental protocol from Gray in 2004. And of course, we also measure the movement kinematics with the motion capture system. For some of the scenario, we also measure the gaze behavior using the eye tractor so that we can know the attention focus of our participants when they are walking. So the task is very simple. We just ask our participant to walk in different walking trials. They walk on the walkway, six meter. They have to step accurately on the stepping target and then walk across the obstacles and then finally to the stopping line. So at that time, we ask their them questions about their focus of attention. So we are assessing their response accuracy using different question. So we could ask the question like internal focus question or external focus question. For internal focus question, an example should be, for example, was your left foot in front of your right foot when you heard the tone? So we should know their focus of attention. So for the external focus condition, we should ask, for example, was the experimenter sitting on a chair when you heard the tone? Of course, we sometimes stand, we sometimes sit. Okay, so uh, we can ask their response accuracy for different questions for the first outcome. Of course, we also measure their movement kinematics as well, as well as their gaze behavior, where they are looking at, for example, their transference of the gaze, for example, uh, the time for their fixation to the target using the eye tracker, the polypore eye tracker. So for the first outcome, respond accuracy, we published an article at the quality processing. And we found that for the high reinvestor, that are the participants with higher scores at the reinvestment scale, they tend to respond more accurately at the internal focus question. That means they tend to focus more on their limbs movement internally when they're walking. And for those no remaster, however, they tend to respond more accurately for the external focus question. That are the questions related to the external environment. So it appears that they attempt to focus more to the environment for the low remaster. For the other outcome measures, the movement kinematics and gaze behavior, we published the other article at the Journal of Gerontology. And we found that 
high scores on the MSLS were associated with the prolonged stance as double support time. So before they step on the target, if you can still remember the figure of uh, the experiment, before they step on the target, they have to stand for relatively longer time when they're approaching the stepping target. However, their foot placement were not accurate when they compare to the low remaster. However, we cannot be able to find any associations between the MSRS and the gaze behavior at that experiment uh, on level round walking. So the implications are, it appears that the ability of high investor to pick up all the environmental information necessary for their successful locomotion might be compromised because they answer the external question less accurately. It seems that they didn't uh, attend a lot for the environment. And for the older adults with a high propensity for movement specific reinvestment, they seem to need more time to plan their future stepping movements because of prolonged stance time and prolonged double support time before they approach the stepping, the stepping target. However, their stepping accuracy was not good, all right, comparing to the low reinvestment. Because of the interesting findings, we also apply for the other uh, uh, research grants from the LGC uh, to further investigate the reinvestment in older adults. So in that grant, we would like to examine uh, the role of internal and external attention focus instruction. That may be possibly the intervention for uh, reinvestment or muscle efficiency and gauge parameters and also uh, the reinvestment as well. So we hypothesize that when we are trying to provide internal attention focused instruction to low reinvestor, we are trying to stimulate reinvestment, right? So that gauge behavior and muscle efficiency should be worsened. However, for the high reinvestor, when we are trying to provide the external focus instruction we are trying to distract them away from inward focus of attention so that we may find their gauge parameters and also the muscle efficiency should be better. So we utilize these two instructions to see whether it works. So according to the constraint action hypothesis, uh, uh, supported by Wolf and her colleagues, they need they did a lot of experiment uh, related to internal and external focus of attention and those instructions. According to them, internal focus instruction for a coach, the coach is required to direct the attention of an individual to their bodily movement directly when they're providing the instruction. So for the external focus instruction, the coach is required to provide the instruction to direct the attention of an individual to the movement effect that include, for example, the apparatus, the equipment, the destination, all right? So externally focused. A classical example uh, for a balancing task on this barometer should be related to a study in 1998 by Wolf and her colleagues. For the external focus instruction, they ask the participants to focus on two lines in front of their feet, okay? They have to make the two lines parallel when they're trying to balance on the stabilometer. And for the internal focus instruction, they simply ask the participant to focus on their feet movement, all right? And have to parallel their feet on the stabilometer when they are maintaining their balance. All right, so before we move on, I would like you to, to vote who won. Okay, do you know who won? Finally, who can have a better uh, rehabilitation outcome comparing the external focus and internal focus. So if you think that it is external focus, please type E in the chat room. If you think that internal focus, then please type I in the chat room. Thank you. Okay, let's vote. Oh, very quick. 
POI. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like that uh, most of you think that it should be Yi, right? External focus instruction. Yes, most of you are correct. Uh, but one of you uh, think that it is I, okay? All right, but, but still most of you <laughs> think that uh, external focus instruction should be, should be better. Okay, thank you very much for your response. And yes, most of you are correct. According to the constraint action hypothesis, external focus instruction should be better. Indeed, Wolf and her colleagues have done a lot of, of experiment in different motor tasks concerning external focus instruction or internal focus uh, instruction. It was quite consistent that for most of the study, they found that external focus instruction would be more beneficial. They thought that according to their constraint action hypothesis, when they're trying to provide the external focus instruction, they are trying to provide our body to have a lecture environment to organize our focus of attention and also our movement automatically. On the other hand, if we provide the internal focus instruction, basically we are disrupting the automatic movement of balance, for example. So it would cause movement failure or movement breakdown. So the result was uh, comparing these two focus of attention, although you can see they are both, they are very subtle changes of instruction. However, we can find that the, we have the attention outcome of the external focus instruction was significantly better than internal focus of attention. All right, so how about the physical therapist? Um, a study uh, published in the year of 2018 by a team of uh, researchers at Netherlands, they found that generally the instructions of physical therapists were slightly more external than internal. But for the feedback, they are mostly internal for the physical therapists in the Netherlands. The article was published at the Disability and Rehabilitation in the year of 2018. Okay, so move back to the methodology of our second series of study. Uh, in which we are trying to investigate the role of attentional focus instructions on gauge parameters and muscle efficiency when our older participants are walking. So the experimental setup actually was quite similar to our first block of study, unless we don't need to have any obstacles at that experiment, just a level ground walkway. And then we provide different instructions so that we can switch the the attention of our participant into either external, internal, or at the control condition. So for the control instruction, of course, we did not provide any instruction. For the internal focus instruction, we asked our participant to focus on their limbs movement during walking. Okay, so focus internally. We are inducing them to focus internally. For the exter external focus instruction, we positioned a monitor at the destination of the walkway, and then we project the digits from one to nine at the monitor. And then we ask the participant to look at the monitor, okay, focus on uh, the numbers at the destination of their walking. So this is the external focus of attention. So we measure different main outcome measures, including the movement kinematics. We measure through the Colossus motion capture system. And the outcome measures include, for example, the medial lateral body sway, the variabilities of our gauge parameters, including the spatial and temporal gauge parameters, for example, the strike length, the strike time variability, the stance time variability, and etc. We also measure their muscle efficiency according to the protocol by first in the year of 2002. All right, we use the surface EMG to measure the uh, muscle co-construction at two pairs of muscle. At the fine, we have the rectus femoris and the bicep femoris. 
And at the trunk region, we have the tibialis anterior as well as the medial gastrocnemius. So we measure the co-contraction of the muscle. Okay, we use the uh, measurement of CCI, the co-contraction index. So higher co-contraction index means that they co-contract more, which indicate a poor muscle efficiency. All right, so for the movement kinematics, we published an article at the Journal of Gerontology in the year of 2020. And generally we found that uh, for the internal focus instruction, it could increase our medial lateral body sway at the pelvis region when we compare to the control and external focus instruction. And also at the sternum, for the internal focus instruction, the body sway medial laterally uh, was significantly higher uh, than the control and the external focus conditions. For the temporal gaze characteristics, we also found that internal focus instruction could increase the variabilities of stance time and swing time when compared to the control and external focus condition. All right, so it seems that if we try to provide the internal focus instruction, it could worsen the gait stability of our patient. So we suggested that for health professions, we should consider exercise caution when we are using the instruction that providing internal feedback or internal instructions to our patient, especially for older adults during walking. For the muscle efficiency, we published the other article at the Age and Aging in the year of 2019. We found that generally for older fallers who presented with higher reinvestment propensity, when we are trying to compare them with the older long fallers, their muscle co-contraction index were significantly higher than the older long fallers, no matter if shrunk and five which indicate a poor muscle efficiency when we are trying to compare older folders and older long folders. And for the older folders only, internal focus instruction could increase their muscle co-contraction at the shunk level, okay? The co-contraction between the tibialis anterior and medial gastrocnemius, okay? Which indicate a stiffening gait pattern when they are walking. So in summary, for the major findings of the outcome measure of muscle efficiency, we found that older folders generally had a higher muscle co-contraction and poor muscle efficiency than older long folders. And for the older folders, when we try to provide the internal focus instruction, it could stimulate them to have a stiffening strategies in walking by co-contract their shrunk muscle more. So the clinical perspective, uh, we did it reinforce actually our thought that we need to exercise caution when we provide uh, internal focus instruction to our patients, especially for older adults during mocking. All right, for the role of conscious motor processing, we published the article at the Experimental Gerontology in the year of 2020. And we divided the participant into low reinvestment group and the high realistic group, if you can, be, if you can still remember uh, our hypothesis for the low reinvestment, when we are trying to induce their reinvestment or internal focus of attention using the internal focus instruction, it would cause worsening of their walking stability. Okay, so the result actually was the same as what we expect. That is for the low reinvestment, when we provide internal focus instruction, it will increase their stride time, shorten their stride length, and increase their medial lateral body sway as well. So it, it reinforced our, uh, our thought that uh, we should exercise caution when we try to apply inward focus related instructions. So for the high reinvestor, unfortunately, we could not be able to find anything. That is, we cannot be able to utilize the external focus instructions to decrease their internal focus so that to improve their walking stability. 
However, in our follow-up study, because we thought that, it may be because of the task difficulty. The task difficulty may not be difficult enough to elicit very high conscious motor processing or reinvestment propensity for our high reinvestor, so that we cannot be able to use the external focus instruction to reduce their propensity. So we change the working environment and the task difficulty. And in some of our pilot study, we finally found that Basically, for high investor, when they work in a more complex working environment, when we try to provide the external focus instructions, it appears to be able to reduce their investment tendency. All right, so up to now, uh, we know that reinvestment appears to be not good, especially for older adults with limited working memory. Internal focus instruction seems uh, to be able to induce reinvestment further and deteriorate the movement. For the external focus instructions, it appears that in the complex working environment, we will be able to decrease the reinvestment propensity for our patients with high reinvestment tendency. As a result, indeed, we have rotation strategies to ameliorate reinvestment in older adults are essential, right? And as a result, we can be able to uh, provide more resources for our older adults if we eliminate the reinvestment uh, in the limited working memory. As a result, the working, working performance of our older adults or even the dual tasking capability of older adults, especially under stress, could be improved. And ultimately, we can be able to reduce the risk of falling. But how? Can we do anything for reinvestment? or actually it is lecture, we cannot do anything. Indeed, the potential training or learning methods can be deduced from previous literature of rehabilitation as well as sports psychology. Obviously, for example, dual task training and external focus training, we could be able to distract our patient with high reinvestment propensity from internal focus of attention. So it seems to be possible to add as one of the interventional uh, measure for high reinvestment. And from the point of view of um, sport psychology, they also have implicit motor learning in which they try to provide less verbal rules when they are trying to train the patient. Actually, this protocol has been used in different study in overseas, for example, in the Netherlands or in UK. They try to know whether implicit motor learning with less verbal rules accumulation can be able to reduce the reinvestment or the improve the uh, potential uh, uh, walking or movement uh, efficiency of the patient. So for the analogy learning, it is quite similar to implicit motor learning. According to the theory from the sport psychology, they can try to use a biomechanical metaphor to represent the complex verbal rules. So when the patients are going to learn the motor task, they will learn from the analogy rather than a complex rules. So it is also possible. But of course, we still don't know because there are no investigation into this direction. So because of the potential of the interventional study, our two proposals were, were supported by the LGC to further investigate the potential um, intervention to ameliorate or to reduce the reinvestment tendency of our older adults. The first study that we got support uh, should be related to uh, the examination of the effects of single task, dual task, and analogy learning on walking during rehabilitation of our older adults uh, during walking. Because the, the, the research actually is still uh, ongoing and uh, we didn't have the results yet, uh, we hope that we can provide you with the results and the exact training protocol later if we can prove that uh, any one of the intervention is efficient. However, I can share with you about our schematic diagram of the study design. So we will recruit uh, in total 105 participants, and then we randomly assign them into three groups, single task, dual task, and analogy learning. And then they have to complete 
12 training sessions within four weeks, okay, either single task training, dual task training, or analogy training. And then we have to assess their performance, for example, their balance, their working ability, their reinvestment tendency, their fear of falling, and etc. during time zero at phase nine. And then time one, post training, and then at time two as well, six month follow up. So we will also follow up their four, four rates or the four incidents within the six months follow up. All right, I hope that the result, uh, that we can collect all the data soon and then uh, we can uh, share with you about the results later. Okay, for the other study that uh, uh, was supported by the RGC, uh, we just start uh, this experiment uh, and uh, it was related to the attentional focus instruction, the effect of the attentional focus instruction on reinvestment as well as the uh, gaze parameters and balance as well when the older adults are walking. So of course, this study is still ongoing and therefore we cannot be able to provide you with the exact training protocols as well as uh, the result at that time. So for the schematic diagram of this study, we recruit 108 participants and then we randomly allocated them into three groups, low specific focus of attention, external and then internal, and they have to participate in 12 training sections within four weeks. We also assessed their performance uh, at T0, at T1, and then T2. T0 uh, will be the baseline, and T1 will be the post-training, and T2 will be the six-month follow-up. And uh, we will also follow up their four incidents within the four, six months of uh, follow-up period. We hope that we can complete the data collection soon and then share with you whether this intervention or the training protocol is uh, efficient for older adults with high reinvestment propensity. All right, so what's next? Besides our investigation of the mechanisms in reinvestment and the potential, potential interventional studies in reinvestment, what could we do next? Although in the first part of study, we cannot be able to find the relationship between the gaze behavior and the reinvestment propensity. However, we thought that in a complex environment, perhaps we could be able to find the association between the gaze behavior. For example, the premature gaze transfer uh, from the target for older fallers and the association of this phenomenon with reinvestment. If we can find out the association, then perhaps we can design the other more appropriate intervention, for example, the gaze training or the other methodology to reduce the reinvestment propensity for our older adults. All right, although we can say that those changes in attentional focus instruction or those changes in motor learning methodology for example, the analogy learning, they're all subtle change. However, I have to reinforce that we don't have to make big changes before it can be important. Subtle changes can be important. An example should be uh, uh, a study that I presented in a Lancet conference in the year of 2016 independently section uh, on behalf of our team. We investigate when we try to change the built environment, for example, the banista of the stairs a little bit that the participant cannot be able to aware of, still it can change their walking behavior as well as their perception of the stairs. So subtle changes can also be very important. Instead of we have to change a lot, then it can be important. All right, so ultimately, I hope that the walking ability, the movement ability of our older adults can be as smooth or as automatic like child this time. And this was just a moment ago, back at the sixth, Charles Schwartzel, short of the green in two, just this uphill pitch. And it looks good. <laughs> The same person, indeed. And I hope that uh, the risk of falling of our older adults 
can be decreased as well. So I have to special thanks my immediate mentors and academic supervisors, and also the other academic work supervisor. They provide me with opinions about uh, my study program, and also my clinical work supervisor in the Princess Margaret Hospital. They inspired me a lot in clinical research. And last but not least, my research team with different uh, postgraduate students, as well as research assistant. Without you, our research program could not be able to complete. So thank you very much for your help and assistance. So that's the end of my presentation today. So here are the reference if you're interested. And welcome any questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thompson, for a very stimulating um, talk. And uh, so if you have any question, you can type in the chat box and um, we will uh, invite Thompson to answer a question. Any question from the audience? So there's one question to, um, uh, to ask the use of mirror in front of the body weight support treadmill training is a kind of uh, internal focus? Uh, uh, I cannot say that it is completely uh, external focus training, but um, uh, yeah. The, uh, the, the question internal focus. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think, I think that it, it is relatively less internal, I can say. Uh, if you refer to the study from the Netherlands, they also regard this type of uh, training as both internal and external, because uh, you are referring to the internal movement uh, kinematics of the limbs. But at the same time, when we are asking the participant to look at the mirror, this is some kind of more external comparatively. Okay, so according to uh, the study for in the Netherlands, uh, it is both, I can say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? So for the uh, training in, in your studies, um, your, your ongoing studies, yep. you divide the older adults into three, three groups yep. um, to receive due task training, analogy training, etc. Yep. Uh, I'm interested to know what is the inclusion criteria of these older adults. Are they followers or um, non followers and uh, what, are, what are the physical ability? To join uh, uh, they, they should be uh, with a uh, kinetic assessment score uh, uh, less than 24. So it indicates uh, they are moderate to uh, high risk of falling. Mm -hmm. yep. so, so they should have a little bit uh, uh, balance problem, uh, a little bit risk of falling. Yep. Right, right, right. So, uh, so they actually have uh, moderate risk of falling. Yeah, moderate risk of falling. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> oh, so, okay. Another question is uh, for the external focus training, yeah. was it mainly two-dimensional or three-dimensional or will there be any differences? Uh, we didn't have any, it is a very interesting uh, question. We didn't have any investigation related to this issue. Uh, I can say, I don't know. Uh, but perhaps we can further investigate into that for uh, either 3D or 3D or 2D should be more effective. So I can say I don't know at this moment. Mm -hmm. Because in uh, from yeah, the yeah, same yeah audience. They say they uh, visited U of Toronto some yep. times ago and they yep. use 3D to evaluate, evaluate or to evaluate. Yep. So I think evaluate is different from training, right? Yeah, yeah, it's different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the point. So is there any, uh, I mean, it's int very interesting for uh, the re reinvestment uh, theories and also the 
uh, due task training, etc. Um, any 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 people or uh, is not um, suitable to receive this type of training? What do you think? Uh, if the quality not sound enough, then perhaps uh, they may not be very suitable to receive this kind of training because they may not be able to understand uh, the instruction quite well. So they use their own attentional focus uh, for their movement execution rather than following our instruction in focus of attention. How about, how about their physical ability? If they force a lot, uh, uh, recurrent followers, etc., will, will they increase in the risk of this receiving this training? Uh, we don't have the data, but uh, when I observe uh, some of the participants, uh, even with uh, relatively poor balance, they still uh, can be able to participate in internal or external focus training. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any more questions from the floor? One more question. For external focus training, how about the level of task difficulty? Should it be graded? Hmm. It is also a very interesting question. So that's why actually um, this uh, research uh, area is developing. So up to now, actually for the external focus uh, instruction, we are using uh, the well-developed uh, maneuver by the other authors. That, that is observing the monitor and then uh, the digits at the monitor. Uh, we know that if we are trying to further increase the task difficulty of the external focus instruction, it seems that we are providing the dual task for the patient, but not external focus instruction. So we have to exercise caution when we are trying to uh, use the external focus instruction with different difficulties. So that should be the other very good um, experiment to do. We can use different level of difficulties for external focus to see what will be the effect of different level of external focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if for your protocol, you, you um, ask the uh, participant to look at the monitor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, why, why do you choose this, uh, or why do you adopt this protocol? Yeah, because uh, uh, we, we adapt it from uh, a published article, and also uh, we try it in our uh, pilot study, and we also uh, uh, monitor the size of the phones as well in, in the pilot study to see whether our participant can receive the information. And actually we design a uh, special environment in which the participant can walk in the environment and then look at the surrounding environment so that all projected with external focus instruction. Um, so, so basically we test uh, the protocol with our pilot trial and pilot study. Uh, and we also uh, test the effect as well in around 10 participants. Uh, it was quite promising in our, uh, in our pilot study. However, uh, for a study with more participants, uh, we are not sure it is still uh, efficient because uh, we have to wait until uh, we have the results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? So I think uh, if there's no more questions, I think we'll conclude the session. Thanks again, uh, Thompson, um, you, for the uh, very stimulating talk. And uh, we, we, we hope to see the, all of you again in the future departmental seminar. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, and, and thank you all of you. Thank you, and have a nice uh, mid-autumn festival. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> have a nice Happy. break for have everyone. Have a good long weekend. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.